various recommendations that are shared with individuals. And of course, there are each translations. Well, someone has compiled a list of intentionally ambiguous job recommendations. Some of you might rem uh, recognize some of these. First, I'm going to share with you the recommendation, and then I'm going to share with you the translation. The recommendation, while he worked with us, he was given numerous citations. Translation, he was arrested several times. <laughs> recommendation, you simply won't believe this woman's credentials. Translation, she, maked, she faked most of her resume. Recommendation, you will never catch him asleep on the job. Translation, he was too crafty to get caught. Recommendation, he doesn't know the meaning of the word quit. Translation, he can't spell it either. He, he can't spell it either. Recommendation, I most enthusiastically re recommend this person with no qualifications whatsoever. Translation, this person has no qualifications whatsoever. Recommendation, I'm sorry we let him get away. Translation, we should have prosecuted. <laughs> Recommendation, she is not your average everyday worker. Translation, every other day maybe. Recommendation, he was always asking if there was anything he could do. Translation, we were always wondering that as well. Recommendation, given the opportunity, I am certain that he will quickly forge a name for himself within your company. Translation, don't leave any blank checks around. Recommendation, you will be fortunate to get this person to work for you. Translation, unfortunately we couldn't get him to work for us either. And recommendation, all in all, I cannot recommend her too highly. Translation, in fact, I cannot recommend her at all. As one who has worked for several boards and agencies who has hired and fired individuals, I can relate to this list. It is sometimes hard to find good people to work with. Jesus doesn't help us in the endeavor. As we find out in our scripture passages, last week Jesus just gave Philip and Nathaniel an offer they couldn't refuse. And this week we find the recruiting of four more people is really simple and easy. Sue, would you share with us the story? I'm reading from Mark 1, 16 through 20. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish, make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As they went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. May God add his blessing to this reading. Thank you. Well, if you haven't figured it out by now, this is the call to discipleship. It was quick, it was easy, it was using very few words and almost decisive. One could say that these two men were just waiting for Jesus to show up. In fact, one could say that, that, uh, that you could almost hear one say, he had me at hello. Now let's say a show of hands. How many are you familiar with that quote, he had me at hello? So that's about what I thought, about half. Now, okay, um, how many know what movie it comes from? Even less. Yes. One of the things that we're learning in this sermon series is we're matching some wonderful movie quotes with some great Bible passages. And so a few weeks back, we started with Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz who said, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Well-known, well-known passage, well-known movie. The next one was Fido Corleone and the Godfather who said, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Now, some, many people have not seen the movie, but you know the quote. Now, today's one is a little bit more obscure. Uh, it comes from a movie that um, um, was not spectacular. It came out in 1996. Um, but the phrase, you had me at hello, really became very common. And we're going to watch the clip. It's a little bit longer than the clips that we've had in the past. 
um, but you'll you might recognize where it comes from. Our little project, our company, had a very big night. A very, very big night. But it wasn't complete. It wasn't nearly close to being in the same vicinity as complete. Because I couldn't share it with you. We live in a cynical world, a cynical world. And we work in a business of tough competitors. I love you. You. these 
four qualities down. You have a portion in your uh, bulletin about no seek can write down. And so the first quality that we find from Jesus that he's looking for is people that are teachable. For those who can't see the board, there we go, teachable. Dr. David McKenna shares some insights on why Jesus chose working with working people, why Jesus chose working people rather than well-trained religious leaders of the day. Dr. McKenna believes it is easier to learn than it is to unlearn. One must have a teachable spirit in order to learn. One must be open to the truth in order to receive the truth. Truth and teachability go hand in hand. I've been reading a book called Canoeing the Mountains. It's about Christian leadership. The premise is this. Uh, as Lewis and Clark were looking for the famed Northwest Passage, you know that waterway that leads from the Mississippi all the way to the Pacific Ocean, they heard about the Rocky Mountains. But when they, in their mind, when they were thinking of the Rocky Mountains, they had a, the, the hills of Appalachia. And so as they were canoeing up the Mississippi River, they thought, well, you know, the Appalachian Mountains, we can at least get over them. We can get our canoe over them. They had no idea what the Rocky Mountains were like. And then also when it came to canoeing, they knew all about canoeing. They were canoeing all the way from St. Louis all the way up until the point. And, and then, the, then the book talks about, imagine this core of discovery. As they're canoeing the Mississippi River and they come around the bend and they see the Rocky Mountains for the first time. And they realize there's no way we can get over that. There is no way we can canoe over that. We're going to have to canoe the mountains. Things are going to be different. Thus, they found themselves in uncharted territory. All they had was what they brought with them and what they knew and adapted along the way. They had to be quick studies. They had to be teachable from the people that taught them new ways of getting over the mountains and how to encounter this new land. Now, do you think the church is in the same canoe? You bet we are. We are, as one bishop said, very good for doing the church for the 1950s. The problem is, it is not the 1950s anymore. And it's not just us. Every church in America is seeing a decline. We can't keep canoeing the river when there are mountains ahead of us. We are headed into uncharted territory. It reminds me of the story I heard once about a, 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 a murder, murder that escaped from a prison in Pennsylvania. Um, it was actually pretty easy to get to catch him because it happened in 19, he went into jail in 1980. And when he came out, sometimes years later, he, he was able to steal a car. But when it ran out of gas, he didn't know how to use the self-serve pumps. Then his problem was he went to his old neighborhood. And there were so many changes that he didn't recognize street signs. He didn't recognize his own street that he lived on and become a dead end. He, he was caught and easily was taken back to jail because of tremendous amount of change. So we do live in a lot of change. Next week is our daughter, our oldest daughter's 20th birthday. Hard to believe that Sarah and I had a daughter when we were both seven years old, but that's all right. Uh, she will turn 20 next week. And so we've been thinking a lot about what life was like in 1998. Well, if you remember back in 1998, we shared one cell phone. We also had a landline. And so when we would share a cell phone, if you remember, uh, long distance was a big deal. If you called outside your calling area, you got charged for it. And don't even think about calling out of state. Those prices were really jacked up. And then there was the internet. The internet was tough. Uh, just trying to get onto the internet meant that you had to tie up your landline. It was dial-up. It took forever. And when you finally got online, you had to make a decision. Okay, do you keep your phone on busy? Because it took forever to get online and you want to stay online. Um, and then speaking of the internet, uh, when I was in seminary, uh, there were only, well, oh, let me back up. Um, many of the ideas that I received for preaching and sermon illustrations and, and even the idea for the church children's sermon that I got here this morning, I get online. 
But back in 1998, when I was in seminary, there were only five websites of pastors that would post their sermons before Sunday. How do I know this? Well, back in 1998, I was in seminary. And so I would be in Kansas City all week, and when I would come home, I did what was called the Saturday Night Special. I just got to get something on paper. I got to preach to these folks on Sunday morning. And so I went to every single website that I could find available for sermons for that following Sunday, which were five, looking for ideas. Things have changed. We also had these things called VCRs. Remember, you had to rewind the tape. And, oh, in January of 1998, let's see, we were, Nebraska was celebrating something called the National Championship. And who were we quarterbacked by? Scott Frost. A lot has changed in 20 years. Babies that I baptized 20 years ago are now in college. Uh, kids that I had in youth group now have kids of their own, and they have not moved back to those communities. Adults that I worked with that were running the church are now in independent living centers. Change is inevitable. Is the church ready? Are Christ's disciples ready? Jesus is looking for people who are teachable. Next one. Jesus is looking for people who are decisive. There we go. Recently I heard about a young man, oh, excuse me, um, if you might have picked up on a theme developing here, uh, not just we have scripture passages that match really well with some great movie quotes, but they all call for a decision to be made. Uh, a few weeks ago we heard about John the Baptist who says we need to repent, we need to ask for forgiveness, we need to be baptized. Uh, next week Jesus gives Philip and Nathaniel an offer they can't refuse. And today we have four more disciples who respond as soon as Jesus opens his mouth. Each one calls for a decisive decision. Do we respond to this message or not? Recently, I heard about a, a young man that, that called up an insurance agent. And when he was talking to him, he was doing it really fast and he was definitely in a hurry. And he says, um, do you insure uh, 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 houses? And, and the insurance agent said, yes, we do. I, I just need to make an appointment. Let's uh, make a time that I can come out and look at your house. And, and the guy on the phone says, um, uh, can, can't you just do it over the phone? And the insurance agent says, no, i, I got to come out. I have to take pictures of the house. I need to measure it. And then the guy on the phone says, well, you better hurry up. The house is on fire. <laughs> there are some issues that are too important to not put off. A decision has to be made. Take this story from Ann Landers. In one of her columns, the person wrote, dear Ann, I have, I've got, I have, excuse me, dear Ann, I have got to decide between a new car and getting engaged. I really love this wonderful young lady, but every night when I go to sleep, I dream about the car. <laughs> when we hear that invitation from Christ, does he have a, us at hello? Or do we sit down and make a list of pros and cons? Do we form a committee? Do we talk it over with our friends to see if it's cool enough? Do we say we're going to sleep on it? Jesus is looking for people who are decisive. Next, Jesus is looking for people of character. Remember, Jesus is a pretty darn good HR person. He picks some really good people. Warren Buffett, <coughs> richest man in Nebraska, one of the richest men in the world has done a pretty good job of picking people that he works with. And one of the things that he says when it comes to hiring people, he says, somebody once said that in looking for people to hire, you look for three qualities. Integrity, intelligence, and energy. And if they don't have the first, the other two will kill you. If you were looking to hire someone to work for you, where would you begin? I think you'd be, begin with people that are trustworthy. People that you can trust. People that, that you can depend on them. Now, this is not to say the disciples were perfect. Jesus didn't pick everyone that was trustworthy, but he did a pretty good job. Uh, there's a silly story about Jesus sitting there uh, at the time of the Last Supper. And he looks over and he sees Judas is going to betray him in a few hours. And he looks over and he sees 
Peter, who was going to deny him three times. And he looks over to the side and he sees Thomas, who is uh, going to doubt him when Jesus needs him the most. And Jesus is kind of looking at this scene, and he realizes he knows what he needs to do. And he calls over the head waiter and he says, Chuck, separate checks, please. <laughs> there were times when the disciples did disappoint Jesus. There were times when he found their lack of understanding quite frustrating. But only knew that, with the notable exception of Judas, he would be able to entrust the kingdom to these very ordinary men that he had called. A few years back, there was a Roman Catholic scholar by the name of Michael Walsh who published a book called The Triumph of the Meek with the subtitle, Why Early Christianity Succeeded. And this is what he said. The movement had begun in a very remote corner of the empire. Its founder had been executed. It was persecuted as it, was, was, as it competed with other religions. Yet, within a little more than three centuries, it became a dominant force in the empire. And then he points out to say, with various contributing factors, certainly a major one was the believer's firm commitment to Christ and his unique way of life. They yielded to the spirit instead of their lower nature. They were teachable. They were decisive. They were people of integrity. And there was one more thing. They were people with courage. Jesus didn't start with people who had doctors in theology. He didn't start with religion professors. He didn't start even with people who were professional clergy. Jesus started with laity. Jesus wanted people who were tested by wind and waves and not sheltered in the temple all week. When I first started as a pastor, I was 23 years old. I was fresh out of college. My roommate in seminary was about twice my age. He was going on about his third or fourth career. And he would tell me all these stories about his life experience. And one time I even told Mike that I often would use his stories in my sermon illustrations because he actually lived it. He had this experience with him. And here recently, when I was out of the professional ministry, I learned more about what people thought about the church, about pastors, about religion, than anyone would ever share with me as a pastor. As one who grew up a preacher's kid, one who went right into the ministry, I found when I was out of the ministry, it was eye-opening. I was in a different um, economic climate, as I shared with the Dave Ramsey program. Things changed with us dramatically. I learned for the first time after 16 years how to apply for a job, how to, how to work with, with resumes. I learned about what people were, how people were challenged when it came to health insurance and minimum salary. It was a vastly different way of life, how to navigate a very different HR system. Now, I will say it was kind of nice having someone pay my Social Security tax. That was different. But otherwise, it gave me a very unique look on life. So when Jesus was picking the people that were going to work with him, he was choosing people out of this group. I mean, look what we find in this ranks. We have fishermen like Andrew, Peter, Thomas, and Nathaniel. We have business people like James and John. Matthew was a tax collector, which meant that he was hated by the populace, but always under the thumb of the Romans for more revenue. Simon was a politician, enough said. However, he was a zealot, which meant that he was a politician of reproach. Judas was the treasurer of the group, which meant that he had some math skills. And then Bartholomew, Thaddeus, and James, we don't know too much about them, but we do know that they're from Galilee, which meant that they were probably poor farmers or poor laborers. These were the people that were tested by the ways of life. And Jesus picked them. He picked them out to walk with them and change the world. I think we can understand that statement, you had me at hello, why it resonated with that much. These people could face whatever challenges ministry had in front of them, and these were definitely people of courage. Stanley Moneyham writes of the modern church. The sin of this generation of Christians, he says, may be that we play it safe. We are one talented persons whose sin was not that he was lazy, but that he was afraid. He was fearful of losing what he had. 
There are times in life of every Christian when we must go for broke. Or as Peter Marshall put it more pointedly, church members in too many cases are like deep sea divers encased in suits designed for many fathoms deep, braving march or marching bravely to pull out plugs and bathtubs. Who is Christ looking for today? People who are teachable. When they're facing the Rocky Mountains of a changing landscape, they learn something different. People who are decisive. When they spot a need in the community, they fill it. People who have a sense of character. The community, the community knows they're trustworthy and they treat each other with respect. And then people of courage. They're not afraid to carry one of these on their car. A few years back, Richard Cushing wrote about this. He said, if all the sleeping folks will wake up and all the lukewarm, lukewarm folks will fire up and all the disgruntled folks will sweeten up and all the discouraged folks will cheer up and all the depressed folks will look up and all the estranged folks will make up and all the gossiping folks will shut up and all the dry bones will shake up and all the true soldiers will stand up and all the church members will pray up and if the Savior of all the world will be lifted up, then we can have the greatest renewal this world will ever Are you a person who is teachable, decisive, have a sense of character, and courage? Then Jesus has a job for you. Hello? Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to wait upon us as we give back to you.